Rice or Rodri? Rodri. Rice. <laughs> Where's that right. bump wagon? He just jumps on it. <laughs> on it. <laughs> Rice is he's a very, very good player. You don't have to justify your decision. You've said it. It's fine. Well, he'll be getting the phone call. He'll upset Rodri. Upset Rodri, will he? It's like... Well, he's, he's treading on thin ice as it is, Alan. So. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Rest is Football with Alan Shearer, Micah Richards and me, Gary Lineker. Uh, yes, that's right. The trio are back together. Alan's back. Uh, gents, um, you've had an interesting couple of days um, between you, obviously covering um, the games. Uh, Micah um, has had a little fallout. No! <laughs> Let's not With... make headlines here, Gary. Let's not make headlines. But Pep's had a little snipe, and it, you know, to his Manchester City ambassador. <laughs> this is what I mean. I was, I was confused. So somewhere within the punditry, Gary Neville has basically said City may be coming complacent or whatnot, mm. and Pep must have seen that somewhere. So in his press conference, I think it was for the Villa game, uh, it might have been it might have been after the game, he basically says, um, he goes on, the journalist asked him a question about what do you think about the, the pundit's um, reaction to, to the game uh, and being complacent, something along those lines. And he started going on about different things and form and tactics and all that sort of stuff. And then he basically said... Uh, Gary Neville has not won four in a, a row. Jamie Carragher didn't win one. And Mike <laughs> and Micah Richards has only won one. But I don't understand talking about the Premier League, basically. I and and I was mm. thinking to myself, like, how have I been put into this situation <laughs> when I've been nothing but positive about Man City. I said maybe individual mistakes. I've talked about center halves coming into midfield and not stopping the the counter attack. And and uh, Dave Jones asked me on air, basically, he said to me, uh, a City taking a foot off the gas. And I basically said, no. So this- I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say it. I'm, I'm so sorry, Pep. But, Honestly, I didn't mean to upset you. But I didn't even, what he said, I didn't even find disrespectful. I thought, fair play, if someone's yeah. asked you a question and you want to say something, I didn't take no offence to it at all, but it's the headlines after. Mm. And then all the Man City fans, or Pep puts Micah back in his place, Micah's supposed to be one of us. He's supposed to be City through and through. And he's slagging City off. I never once <laughs> slag City off. So it's gone full circle from something... I'm I'd surprised. I was amazed they even knew Micah Richards <laughs> played for Man City. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, pretty astonishing. You know what the next man? headline is? <laughs> Micah Richards axed as Man City <laughs> ambassador. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He loses his half a million pound a year ambassadorial role. <laughs> He'd finally be able to say what he really thinks. Um, <laughs> I will say one thing, though. On it, that, the, uh, it's very, very irritating that journalists do that in press conferences. What the, I've had that so many times where they'll lift a little tweet you've done or they'll... T pick up something that you said somewhere and they'll go to a manager because they haven't got the balls to ask the question themselves. So they go, mm. well, Micah Richards said, or Gary <laughs> Neville said that you've taken the foot off the gas and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Why don't they say, do you think you've taken the foot off the gas? Because they haven't mm. got the courage to do it. So they, they hide behind people in the public eye to try and goad the managers into res responding um, like that. And I've, oh, that's always, well, I mean, that, got a lot of respect for a lot of journalists in the game but that that side of it is i think has always been tricky because also they can give 
they don't give you the whole picture of what you might have been talking about. So they'll just they'll just take out one little bit from it <laughs> and, and, and then they'll wind the managers up. So they end up having a pop at you and then you, you're in all the headlines of all the papers. Exactly. And think, I've had, I've I've admit, that's been I've taken had, totally out of context. I've had City fans tell me, you're, you, you've never been a legend at our club. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you you, you 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 didn't put uh what 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 was the other one? What was one of the other ones? Oh um, you didn't even play that much the, the year they won the league anyway. Zabaleta, <laughs> they brought Zabaleta back in. I was fine. I was, Zabaleta's our hero. I was gone. <laughs> Finally, they're seeing the true Michael Richards. <laughs> Uh, well, well, Pep wasn't the only uh, manager to get no. the hump. Um, um, Jurgen Klopp last night at the end of the game um, um, dismissed um, the, the presenter as, as arrogant, didn't know what he was talking about, just because he made a, like a really, really mild joke about the fact that Klopp doesn't like a 12.30 kickoff. And I must say, I, I, I don't think he, the, he did anything wrong there. I think Klopp was just obviously stroppy about something um and it was it was really weird i mean it's not a, he said how could you joke about something like that and i think what a 12 30 kickoff and it's not exactly the you know it's not a hill to die on that one is it really i mean <laughs> when, when you look oh. at the things going around <laughs> going on around the world at the moment um but anyway i i understand managers are under pressure i think arteta the other night was a bit was a bit arteta oh, was a little bit give us nothing before the game um and you know what I sometimes I, I wonder what on earth is the point of the of the interviews before the game and sometimes after you know from managers. And it, I mean, I know we had the Arteta rant when it happened at Newcastle, but other than that, sometimes interviews with managers before and after games are a complete waste of time because they're doing an interview the day before. They're doing an interview before the game, an hour before the game. They're doing an interview half an hour after the game. You, it, to their, in their defence, they must think, what on earth are we doing all this for? It's like... Well, they're contractually obliged, aren't they? Oh, they are. So I, know they are. I know that's why the clubs get paid a lot of money for them to do that. But from a manager's point of view, you're always going to protect your players. You're always going to protect your football club. So in the end, you think, sometimes, what's the point? Well, it's it's obviously a contractual obligation for them, but but you can see certainly with some managers. I mean, Pep mm. before before matches um, is <laughs> always pretty dismissive. You can tell he really doesn't want yeah. to be there, and I can understand that. It'd be the last thing yeah. in the world you'd really uh, exactly. want to do. I mean, nowadays as well, you you get in the odd manager being interviewed at half time as well, aren't they? Oh. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, they never really oh, say the anything. Manager. The thing is, they never say anything of interest. They're never going to go, right, we were doing this wrong in the first exactly. half. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to surprise them with three. Of the... <laughs> so they, they never give you anything. So I'm no. actually with you on, on that one. I, I suppose we should yeah. probably discuss the actual football that um, there's been, you know, there's been some cracking stuff over the last few days. Um, let's start with last night, though, and Aston Villa, because I thought they were mm. absolutely uh, magnificent. Even even during the period where I lost um, lost the picture for about ten minutes, um, it's all the the joys of streaming, I suppose. Um, and then <laughs> and then eventually it came back, and and I thought, oh good, I've got got it back. Um, and then and then I'm getting message on my phone like, oh Villa leading and stuff. I'm thinking, what? I've been watching it. <laughs> I, and I thought I must be a bit behind, but it had restarted where, where I'd left it. So I was like 10 minutes behind. And I can't, there's nothing worse than getting a spoiler for a goal, is there? Really? Oh, come on. You need to sort your Wi Fi out in London. Has it not reached that far yeah, yet? No? It was, I don't think it was a Wi Fi. I think it was quite common all over the shop. Um, but, you know, you're going to get that with streaming every now and again. But um, it's a little bit. Um, annoying and then I went back to the Man United game after that and th and when you want to switch between matches it's a great thing to be able to do but it, it, it does take a little while but anyway that's enough of my my whining what a performance from Aston Villa Alan oh, I, I, obviously Gary I didn't see the whole game but I watched the highlights in the car on the, uh, on the way back um, 
I mean, sometimes you can say wins are fought a bit fortunate, a bit lucky, got a decision, got the and but there was none of that from Aston Villa. From what I saw, because obviously I was doing the Man United game against Chelsea, from what I saw with Aston Villa, they thoroughly deserved it. They were the better team. They pressed them, they harassed them, and they thoroughly deserved the three points. But it it, it was actually a really good hiding um, they were given. Villa were like the better team in every department right throughout. I cannot remember Manchester City being dominated by any team in a game like that for an awfully long time. Yeah, I had the same problems as you actually, Gary. Oh. I couldn't I couldn't get on there, so I had ended up watching <laughs> Man U Chelsea. But like Alan, I did watch the highlights and I've got my um Y Scout, so I watched all the clips. And it was how impressive they were on the press more than mm. anything. Like Bailey and Watkins up front. The, all the stuff that Man City do to teams, they did to Man City. But it's not only that I was having the, the confidence to do that. The manager needs all the oh, praise. His yeah. record since he's he's come to the Premier League, it must be like third or fourth best within the whole league. It's absolutely incredible. The confidence is high with all the injuries Villa's had as well. But Man City was always going to be... It was always going to be difficult for Man City without a Rodri away from home against Villa. Obviously, he was suspended... Jack was suspended, but it doesn't matter. All the credit has got to go to Aston Villa. I thought Douglas Louise was, was terrific. Um, and, um, I mean, in that midfield area, they, they were just on top. As you said, they were pressing them high. They were constant. I mean, they had so many shots. There. I mean, more than I think City have been on this receiving end of for, for, for quite some time. Um, I'm going to ask you, Micah, do you think Pep and Manchester City have, have got a bit complacent? <laughs> <laughs> Can we have a yes or a no, please, Michael? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> For the sake of my ambassadorial role, no. <laughs> no. In all seriousness, no, I don't think they have been complacent because when I was doing the Spurs game, Man City Spurs at the weekend. Haaland could have scored a hat trick. Mm. Foden yep. could have scored probably one more. Alvarez could have scored. And normally, last season, they would have put them games to bed. I think this mm. season, I, I, I'm not saying teams are riding their luck, but Spurs are, are having a go. Villa are having a go. Normally, people sit deep and let Man City dictate the ball. People are having a go and saying, okay. We know they could be weak on the counter-attack and they're trying to have a go and exploit exploit that. It doesn't help getting rid of the likes of a, a Mares or a Gundogan. Um, them mm. players were so vital last season, if we're being totally honest. But I don't think it's complacency. I don't. I just think it's come down to individual errors at the wrong times. There's the headline. <laughs> Richard slams Pep Guardiola for selling Mares and Gundogan. Uh, it's a tough, it's a tough business. This, um, uh, this, this, this punditry game, Michael. It's, it, it's tough, but I think, I mean, ultimately, they, you know, they, they are human beings, and and they and they will have dips in form, and that's 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 what happens. However good you are, that's there's a reason that that teams don't win the title um, four or five times on the bounce because it's yeah. it's really hard to do that, particularly when you've got a, a very competitive league um, like um, the Premier League. But um, it kind of takes us on to the Manchester United game because Manchester United, despite all their problems, despite the mm. crisis and all the talk, they're only three points behind Manchester City. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think Ten Hag deserves a bit of credit, you know, because he was under huge pressure after the shambles mm. of the weekend at, at what happened at Newcastle. And he made some big calls. Um, he left Rashford out. He left uh, Martial out. Um and it worked. His team were full of energy. Um, they were a better team. I mean, it should have been probably it should have been six three at half time. You know, such was. Yeah, I enjoyed the. Um, I, I watched most of yeah. the first half before I switched to the to City game or tried to switch to it. Um, yeah, they were. Um, 
they played really well. They were they were the, they were much the better side, weren't they? Yeah, um, yeah, they were. They were much better than Ch- Chelsea. I mean, I worry Chelsea for Chelsea were, a bit. Yeah, I was like, I mean, they're so bad in forward positions. The number, so, I mean, the first half they got into four or five great positions, and it's either a poor finish or a poor final pass. I mean, if I had any hair, I'd have been pulling it out with Mudrick because. <laughs> oh. I agree. It's, it, you know, as a, as a, as a centre forward, you think, come on, just put me in, just lay me in, and it's either two yards behind him or five yards in front of him, thinking, oh my God, just find a simple pass, please. And that that was a constant all throughout for for, uh, for Chelsea. Didn't push as much in the second half, but the first half, I was let me, like, let oh. me ask you something, Alan, because I saw you on you on the pitch doing your bit before the game, mm. um, and all the players are warming up and. Yeah, you've you've been quite well, very critical of of Manchester United and their their players this season. Did any of them try and like when they were warming up, like knock the ball and knock your head off? <laughs> Did anyone say anything? I, I, I... No, I, actually, I don't. I'm not. I'm not comfortable doing that. You know, when you go and stand in the middle of the pitch, <laughs> because, not weird, because of it? but you get might get um, players whacking balls at you, because that's what I would have done if I was a player. But it's like <laughs> awkward because. To do your job, yeah. putting the pundit, you, 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 sometimes you have to be critical, mm. and then you're standing there five or ten <laughs> yards away from the players. But it's like, but you know what it is. Particularly after what happened on Saturday, I, I felt I felt totally fine because mm. I, I I know that their performance on Saturday was unacceptable, and I've criticised for lack of try and etc. And I wouldn't take back a word that I said, and it's true because the manager left them out last night, and then they go and win the game. So. It's it was sort of indicated his decision, but yeah, they were they were much better. And if my if I'm correct in saying that Man United are what three points behind Manchester yep. City, yeah. And and when you look at the criticism and everything else that Man United have had or Ten Hag have had, three points behind City. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Gary just said that about two minutes ago. If he was listening, I was. <laughs> <laughs> But there are, there are a few more behind the leaders. Yeah, well, obviously, um, Arsenal, um, tipped by one of us, I think, to... Oh, to, here we go, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> we can Google Pixel that as well, Michael, we can erase that. No, you can't keep taking things out. Um, and, uh, well, if you're going to do it, do it during the half-time interval. We'll take a break. Welcome back to The Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer and Micah Richards. Um, briefly mentioned the fact that um, Arsenal had got a little gap at the top of the league um, before we went to the break. And they're doing the sort of things you need to do if you're going to win a title or certainly compete for a title. Um, mm. And that's, you know, scoring goals with the very last touch of the game, almost um, Declan Rice's header. Um Four three. I mean, I felt for. Cool. I have to say, I felt for Luton because I thought they really gave a. You know, had a really good go. Obviously, Arsenal were very much on top and had had lots of chances. But um, those kind of moments, what do you need? Well, I was there. I was, so I was lucky enough to be there actually because it was a brilliant game. Um, great little atmosphere. You know what Luton's like—the tight ground—and and they were right behind their 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 players, and it was great to be there. But. Yeah, I felt I did feel for Luton because they gave everything, scored three goals, were really impressive. I know um, the goalkeeper sort of gifted them too. But if you're an Arsenal fan, an Arsenal players, that's a really good sign. Mm. Didn't play particularly well, um, but they kept on going and pushing all the way and getting another late goal as they did last weekend against uh-huh. Brentford, it was, wasn't it? So, I mean, from an Arsenal point of view, you've got to be delighted with that without playing particularly well and getting the three points again. The way they did it, Declan Rice, what what a signing he's been. I mean, 100 million when people were discussing the fee and what have you. He's, it's, I think it's proven to be a bargain. He's just a brilliant player. And to, for him to pop up and get the goal, I mean, it makes such a difference, doesn't it? Particularly with Man City being beaten and then the, the, them getting the, that, that three points it's huge this week's been huge for uh, for Arsenal and for for Liverpool so um, yeah well done Arsenal did, did you notice anything different Al you know at the game because normally when we're doing match of the day or if you're doing Amazon 
sometimes you'd be up doing the co-coms or whatnot. You know, when you're at the game at a tight little ground, can you see who mm. the real leaders of that team are with Arsenal? And do you think they've got enough then to get over the line? Because sometimes it's just about mentality in some games, not just all about ability, you know? Mm. Well, it's a, it's about Arsenal. It's about getting over the line. Um, it's been so long that's, that since they've, they've won it. Obviously, that's what their their aim was before the season, to do better than they did last season. They spent a, a lot of money in, in trying to improve. They have improved. They're better. Um, but I think the hard part for Arsenal is going to be mentally going into the second part of the season is that they, them having the belief that actually, yeah, we can stay this time and um, City or Liverpool uh, are not going to come back to us or Villa or whoever it may be are not going to come back or get get to us. So I think that's going to be the hard part for Arsenal. But I'm really impressed in, in what I'm seeing because it's how many times over the years we've said, just find a way to get three points. And Arsenal have done that in the last two games. That's the impressive thing. I can see leaders in that team, Mike, can't you? Like Declan or Ice obviously is yeah. one. Salibra mm. and Gabriel at the back as, uh, as mm. well, I think. I, I think um, Odegaard obviously even even Saka in his own way Saka, yeah. I mean what a wonderful footballer is I, what, the <laughs> other night again I mean his decision making I, yeah. I mean he, every time you're watching the game you go oh do it and he, do, he does what you, you can see and, and when you're watching a game that's obviously a lot easier than when you're playing a game because you can see the whole picture but he's he's, he's a lovely, yeah. lovely footballer he's so good his delivery as well and set pieces and things like that um, everything about him. One quick question for you both. Rice or Rodri? Rodri. Rice. <laughs> I'll go I love Rice. He, he lo Where's that bandwagon? He just jumps on it. <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> It's Rice, his is, Rice is, is a very, very good player. You don't have to justify your decision. Right, You've Mike, said it. It's huh? fine. The book. Okay. Well, he'll be getting the phone call. He'll get Rodri upset. Rodri, will he? It's like... Well, he's, he's treading on thin ice as it is, Alan. So. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough call. I mean, I... Rice is everywhere. When I mean, Rodri's brilliant as well. Obviously, they're both absolutely top players. But I think the way Rice has gone straight into things at Arsenal and, and become, you know, absolutely mm. one of the most important players and the way the yeah. way he runs with a boy, he covers distance, he bursts the lines. I think Rodri overall would probably get a few more goals. Um, but, there's, you know, they are, there are certain similarities. They both keep the ball really well, very rarely give it away. Um both terrific players, that's for sure. Yeah, very good. Excellent, Both of them are superb. Excellent, yeah. fo excellent footballers. Um, I'll go back a little bit because we've got the title race now, haven't we, with um, the, the Aston Villa in the, the top three. Could they conceivably put a challenge in this season to the title? Um, or is ab top five probably is, is, would be the ultimate that they could achieve? Yeah, that for, for me, I don't think they can challenge for the title. No, I think when you go into the second part, the, a part of the season, um, what's been impressive is is that because they're playing on a Thursday night as well in Europe, then to have mm. or not have as many injuries as a lot of other teams uh, have, have had, then that's the impressive thing and keep on going. I mean, I think that's, is it 14 wins on the spin now at home oh, for yeah. Villa? Amazing at, uh, at home, yeah. So they're brilliant, but no, I don't. I don't see them um, in the title race, but I, d I definitely see them challenging for uh, for Champions League. I don't know, third, fourth, or fifth. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, they'd be one of the, the slight worries for you, Alan, with your Newcastle hat on, wouldn't they? In terms of the top five, the chasing pack this year has really improved. Villa have, Spurs have, obviously Newcastle have, Brighton. Um, yeah, so, and I, I think that's what we're going to see, is that we're going to see more teams taking points off each other because everyone, certainly within the top six or seven, has improved. Yeah. It's good for the league, though. We want a competitive yeah. league. We want more teams in it than, than just City running away with it, don't we, Micah? Agreed. I, I think um, it all depends on injuries because you remember with, with Spurs, they was on fire. I think... Realistically, Champions League is where Villa should be aiming, but but who knows? You keep everyone yeah. fit, you get something in January. 
But I just think with that week when Spurs looked like they were flying, then they lost three in a, in, in a row, but they still played well, lost some key players. I just think at the second part of the season, Alan is totally right. When your top players sort of drift off a little bit, you need someone to carry you through to the next level. And I just don't know if Villa will have that in the second mm. part. Yep, I, I wouldn't disagree. Um, let's switch um, down to the other end of, of the table. Um, well, not quite the bottom, but um, alarming result um, for Nottingham Forest last night. They've had, a, they've had a bad run now. Conceded 12 goals in the last four games, lost five of the last six. Um, they, you know, There's a danger of them dropping into that relegation battle. Um, there was talk about Steve Cooper's position. Um, at the same time, let's give a huge shout out to Fulham yeah. uh, for banging in five goals. And it was lovely to see Raul Jimenez um, scoring a, a couple of goals because we talked about him um, just a couple of weeks ago and the fact that maybe if he scored a, a goal or two, then he'd, he'd come back to that, well, the brilliant form that we saw at Wolverhampton Wanderers. Just goes to show though, Gary, doesn't it? What was it? We did our predictions thing, what, a month ago? Yeah. And I said, I probably think the only one I got wrong was Forrest. They're flying just below mid-table. Um, I don't. I didn't think they were going to be in a relegation battle. Well, I mean, I put them in there originally, but I have to say no. I think I'm wrong. But it's amazing, isn't it? A month later, he's under huge pressure. So to basically, get what five. you're trying to tell us here, Alan, is actually you were right about all twenty. <laughs> well, I, mean, I was waiting for you to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we've already seen. We saw the first manager go, didn't we? Yeah. With uh, Heck and Bottom when they were battered five off uh, off Burnley. Um, and as he was already there was already question marks in the media about Steve Cooper. So I hope I hope they don't press the button. I hope they give him um, a bit longer because I, I like him as a coach. I think he's done a wonderful job. Yeah, and I think he's probably. I mean, I thought the same with Brendan Rodgers, and I think sometimes a manager earns the right. Yeah. Um, yeah. To at least try and keep them up to give them a, a run at it because as we've always said that grass is greener on the other side is not is so often not um, mm. the case but um, but Jimenez that was that was a great to see Micah we were yeah, talking about that not long I ago. said on one of the early episodes that he was going to be banned <laughs> up <laughs> a round of applause a, a sarcastic <laughs> And H and John, the, the producers, they will be able to dig it out if Alan Bum. I thought he would have scored more than that because he's a talent. And Fulham create chances. And yes, he had a horrific injury, but you, you don't really lose that talent. It, maybe you lose your timing and your confidence, but it was great to see him score. He took his first goal brilliantly, just lifted it over the, the keeper. Lovely um, connection with it. And long may it continue because it's a great story. Yeah, it is. Um, Bournemouth are on a roll um, mm. um, with Iraola. He's obviously he's taken a, a little bit of a time for, for the players to get accustomed to his what he wanted. But... Um, won four and drawn one of the last six games now and um, on a real roll and I think a bit of a turning point wasn't it when you remember when Bournemouth played Wolves and Wolves beat them and we were all like oh how do they feel now you know because yeah. of the, the Gary O'Neill situation but after that they've gone from strength to strength and it seems as if to get, they get into grips with with his style and they're, they're getting results so um, yeah they'll be delighted now I feel as though I don't owe the, the Bomber fans an apology, but I had them down. I couldn't really see what was what they was doing. And we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about we could see the improvements, getting results, but they actually look like a very good side now. It's just whether they can keep that going for the remainder of the season. It is. Um, I want to finish um, um, this episode by talking about... Um, the television side of the game a little bit because it was announced um, this week um, that their new record, £6.7 billion deal for Sky and TNT to show up to 270 live games. And the deal includes Match of the Day um, being maintained on the BBC. I think that's, a, well, I would say this, a good move from for, for the Premier League, extra four years, because I think we have to remember that Pretty much half the country doesn't um, and can't afford um, the likes of 
uh, Sky and, and TNT for their extra football. So they get their Premier League fix uh, through match of the day. But it's obviously um, great news for us and, and great news um, for those of you that work at Sky, Micah, as, as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so it's, it's onward and forward. But the Premier, it's, 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 a, it's a monster of a business, isn't it? <laughs> like, it's, it's... Can, you, can you remember when it back in... 1992 when it first started from then yeah. to now I mean what did you say 6.7 billion I mean oh my word it is, a, it is an unbelievable juggernaut wherever you go wherever in the world you are the, the first thing anyone ever says is the Premier League this or the Premier League that it is just gigantic it's incredible yeah my dog's just farted it stinks <laughs> 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 He's taking me off my stride. Oh, Phil. Yeah. Does that so, double thought erase I mean, that's unacceptable, well. that is, Phil. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, I wish we could erase that one. <laughs> oh. Anyway, um, Amazon, um, who've obviously been showing um, some of the games and they've done this week, um, didn't get any rights in this new deal. Um, they're obviously mm. probably focusing perhaps on, I think, the Champions League coverage starts next um, season where it's, I think they get Tuesday nights of the Champions League uh, coverage. Um, the other thing um, that happened um, this week was a couple of cup competitions where both ITV and BBC um, um, take their picks of the matches. Let's start with the FA Cup. Um, Alan was really excited, the fact that we might um, on BBC do Sunderland against Newcastle. Um, in the end, that game had to be played as, a, as an early kickoff, um, which is obviously not great for television. Um, and the BBC chose um, Arsenal <laughs> against Liverpool, which is uh, a lot further south for some of us. Than a bit a bit disappointing for you there, Al. Although, you, I don't know, going to Sunderland for you must be quite, it's quite scary. Bring back so many bad memories. <laughs> Man, good memories. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I hope the bosses don't mourn when Arsenal and Liverpool put their reserve sides out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's you, yeah. you couldn't ignore that one. It's such a huge game, isn't it? Two giant clubs, so I, I understand why. Have these been announced already, Gary, or is this like... Uh, I think. Are you, I, sure, I, are you I, sure you're allowed I, to... Uh, Releases I'm, I'm, inside information. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, it's that, it's that's what's happened. So yeah. So uh, if they haven't, the other one they're doing is Boroughville as well. <laughs> yeah, they are. And that's on, that is on the Saturday. Uh, Middlesbrough yeah. versus um, Aston Villa. Aston Villa flying at the moment, and uh, Middlesbrough after a you know, really tough start to the season have, have, have certainly steadied the ship. Um, and the other thing is um, to let you know because we were talking last week about the European Championship. Um, was drawn and then they have the divvy up between BBC and ITV and I told you how it works that um, on the, every tournament um, they alternate who gets first pick um, ITV had first pick in this one and this is roughly how it went just in terms of the first um, just to, to let you know how it works so um, ITV's first pick was the first choice of uh, a semi-final. So obviously they're thinking that if England get through or even Scotland or even unlikely because Wales are not qualified yet, but they might do. So one of the home nations got all the way to the semi-final. That would be um, a huge game for them, understandably so. Um, so they went with the first um, choice of the semi-final. Um, BBC, we responded with the first choice, as you would, of the quarter-final. So again, if one of the host nations is um, home nations is it goes all the way um, to the quarter-finals, um, that would be um, the first pick there. Um, after that, um, ITV went first choice of the last 16. Um, and then, of course, you look at the group game. So um, BBC um, chose one of the group matches. ITV chose the other. Then um, the BBC got um, the other. So I think uh, BBC have got Denmark and Serbia, ITV Slovenia. And then it branches out because then we're thinking um, ITV have got the choice then. And their choice really would have been either to go the second semi-final um, or a second quarter final, but more likely the second semi final. But because obviously it's a huge game in, in one of the other groups, Scotland um, against Germany, they went for Scotland Germany, and then BBC goes for the second semi final because you don't really want one channel to have 
both semi-finals. So it's and then it goes on and on and all the way, and then it would be two. Uh, BBC got two more two of the Scotland group games, which is great news. Um, and then the the difficult one is obviously because you don't know whether Wales will qualify. So and if they do, I believe BBC might get two of those as well. So all in all, you end up with what you get. Um, but it's an interesting kind of formula. I was having some problems then. Can you just do all that again? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what you say, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but, I mean, look, there's lots to look forward to. Some great FA Cup matches and and the Euros at the end of the yeah. season. I think I think on that note we should call it a day. Just because I can't repeat it, Alan. I, I, I hope I didn't make too many mistakes. I think I think I got it about right. Um, uh, that's it from us uh, for this week. Of course, um, we'll be back um, with our usual episode on Monday morning and um, but thanks for all your support uh, and all your love of the podcast um, walking down the streets people stopping me I don't know whether you're getting the same thing boys yeah it's amazing the response is fantastic people are loving it except for Pep Guardiola Micah <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it thank you very much uh, goodbye from me goodbye from me goodbye from me cheers <laughs> <laughs>